But Penny asked if I'd give this talk on, on the Green New Deal, um, and particularly the, the subject of how we might pay for it. Um, so I've got the title slides Penny had on the group, and I've just, as you've seen, added this little thing in MMT. Um, so we'll come to that in the talk as well. Okay, so starting off, um, who's heard of the Green New Deal? Maybe wave your hands if you have in the background. So it, it certainly come up. Um, probably initially um, it's been most publicized uh, as, a, as a US thing. So if you put that into Google and you looked at Wikipedia, um, the, the kind of definition there is the Green New Deal is proposed package of United States legislation that aims to address climate change and economic inequality. Okay, so the kind of two big issues, climate change, but also economic inequality. Um, and linking this, so the, the New Deal part being going back to Franklin Roosevelt's time in the 30s in the US. So it's this kind of combination, you know, it's coming from national government, environmental issues, economic issues. Um, putting that into a UK context, uh, there is a Green New Deal UK org. Um, and so they state on their front page that we're building a movement for the Green New Deal. And they describe this as an ambitious national plan to tackle climate breakdown while creating a fair society that works for everyone. Okay, so again, these kind of these three big issues, climate change, something about inequality in a fair society, and the idea that this is something that's happening at a national level, something coming from government. So it's about real kind of systemic change. Okay, so next, um, has anyone here heard of MMT? So a few, few people putting their hands up. So I suspect if I did this a year ago, maybe that would be a lot less. Um, so MMT stands for Modern Monetary Theory. Uh, I'm not going to dive into that anymore now, but, but its purpose will become apparent as we go throughout. Um, but it's just kind of interesting for me to see who's, you know, the, the reach that's getting these days. Let's go back here. Um, so yeah, the, the, the topics of tonight's talk. Um, first, we're going to deal with a, um, a bit more look in detail at what the Green New Deal and what, what we actually mean by that. Um, but then thinking about this as being something that's coming from government level, um, to understand and answer the question, how are we going to pay for it? We need to understand a bit better about how government spending actually works. Okay, so how do we as a society pay for things? Um, what are the things we can afford to do? Um, and importantly on that, what are the real resources available to us? And I kind of, I want this to be a, a kind of uplifting, optimistic talk. Um, and so one of the things I hope you get out of this is perhaps a way of looking slightly differently at the world um, and maybe seeing it as opening up new possibilities that, that maybe we didn't realize were available to us before. Um, and then finally finish with, armed with that knowledge, what we can all do to, to promote change to the, to the current system. Okay, so I've already given this one away. Sorry. I've just, for some reason, my laptop isn't skipping when I press the button to skip slides and then suddenly it jumps too. Okay, so I've already given this one away. I'm not an economist. Um, so I'm actually a, a researcher in medical imaging at the university. Um, this talk is going to involve quite a lot of economics. My first excuse is what I like to call the um, uh, the yes minister excuse for why this is okay. Uh, Humphrey should have seen this coming and warned me. I don't think Sir Humphrey understands economics, Prime Minister. He did read classics, you know. <laughs> he's head of the Treasury. Well, I'm afraid he's an even greater disadvantage in understanding economics. He's an economist. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so apart from joking aside with that, um, there's actually a serious point here, uh, and that is, I want economics is 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 for all of us, right? Um, so, so much of of what happens in the world, um, the decisions that are made around us are based around economic decisions. We're gonna we're gonna look through loads of those throughout the talk. Um, and yet, despite this, this is this is taken from a survey um, run by YouGov that only 12% of the public feel like the media and politicians talk about economics in a way that's accessible and easy for them to understand. And for me, you know, stepping aside just from the 
from the environmental issues, this is just bad for all of us as a society, okay? You know, it, in the same way that politics plays a role in our everyday lives and everything we do, so do economics and the decisions made by economic advisors passed to, pass to politicians and the decisions they make. So if we don't feel like we as society can have these conversations and understand these things, um, then we're all worse off for that as, as a society's communities of democracies. Um, and so as part of that, I think in some ways being an outsider can actually be an advantage. So what I'm gonna hope to do tonight is to try and present some of these ideas in a way that's accessible to all of you. Um, so trying to avoid economic jargon wherever possible. Um, that said, if ever I do slip into anything you don't understand, use terms that, that I've just kind of got used to reading about, then please send a question there and just say, what are, you know, what are you saying at this point? Um, but yeah, economics should be for all of us. So just on this, I added this into my slide today because um, it popped up on my timeline. And I just thought it was quite, quite an interesting example of this. Um, so this was a, a tweet from Dawn French saying, I understand nada about economics. Um, and then this question, could someone explain why, if everywhere will be in recession, we can't make up some new money to pump up everyone's country? Money is man-made. And on the face of it, that's almost quite a simple childlike type question about, about money. But actually, I think if you put that question to, to just about any politician and to most, um, uh, most of the media and plenty of the media that talk about economics, they couldn't actually give you a coherent answer to this question. In fact, pretty much every politician, I think, would probably give you the wrong answer to this question. So, you know, the fact that, that you know, this is how we kind of feel as people that we can't talk about and understand these things is, is something that I think we need to try and try and correct. So hopefully this talk will, um, will add to that. Okay, so moving into, um, into the talk proper. So going back to the idea of the Green New Deal and these, these two great challenges of our time. So the first one, I don't think I, I particularly need to spend long on this slide for this audience. Um, we all know what's happening to the climate, the effect we're having on this. Um, we see this both around the world. You know, when I, when I was writing this talk, it was January and it was in the midst of the terrible wildfires in Australia, but then also things happening more local to us. You know, the, the floods we had. Um, Jen, one of the things where new mills you might have seen in the news was new mills had some really bad flooding in the, um, the valley around, around this area. So, you know, these global effects, these local effects. Um, but then alongside that, the second great challenge that, that we're talking about with the Green New Deal is the economic challenge we're all facing. OK, so we've just been through the decade of austerity. Um, put in a load of headlines here, you know, I could literally have picked thousands of headlines to, to add to this slide. And we've come through that and we know the effect we're, we're seeing on this on our communities. You know, we've got food bank usages up. Um, this headline came out again, just around the time I was, I was kind of finalizing these slides for the original talk in March. In the UK, life expectancy is actually starting to go down, you know, and, and how are we making progress as a society if, if this is happening to us? Um, but just to make clear, this isn't, you know, this isn't just a UK thing. This is a slide talking about unemployment rates across the EU. Um, and we're bad on this list, but we're, we're by no means the worst. You know, this is, this is something that's happening to all developed economies at some level. Um, and off the back of this, if you look last year, still ongoing, there were riots and protests in France, Hong Kong, Lebanon, um, I think this is Ecuador, maybe Bolivia, that's Ecuador, um, this was Chile. So all of these were happening just in the last year alone. Okay, so there's this, there's this global phenomenon of, of there were you know, different local issues at stake in all of these, but an underlying thing of economic insecurity kind of underpinned nearly all of them. Um, on top of that, you know, we're not doing the job of, of um, raising people in the poorest parts of the world out of poverty anymore, certainly not as well as we were. And if you put all those things together, um, so I, I've, I've nicked this slide from Donut Economics. Um, so that's another thing I don't know if people have, have come across. So I know, um, I think Phil posted a link to this on the, on the New Mills group. Again, it's had some media profile. 
And I think this is one of the most crystal clear ways those kind of ideas have been encapsulated in the single, single image and an idea. So what this is showing you um, is the idea that for us to be sustainable as a society, we have this donut. And so on the outer edge of this, you know, this is all the, this is what we're doing to the climate and these are the limits that we have to live within. Um, but then on the inside of the minimum requirements we need to meet to keep people out of property, to keep people healthy. And our societies at the moment, we're failing this in both directions. So people all around the world, millions of people aren't having their needs met. But at the same time, we're breaking through the other side in terms of climate change, pollution, all of the things like that. OK, so so this kind of provides us um, Kate Roth, who, who, who's known for for donut economics, she describes this as the selfie of Earth. OK, and this is this is kind of telling us what's what's happening. The problem, of course, is if we take these two two issues and try and do something about them in the system that we currently live in, if you take people in poverty and do the steps we know you need to try and do to raise them out of that, we inevitably then start increasing consumption. OK, and so, you know, a simple thing for this, this shows a chart of increasing meat consumption around the world. And we know the environmental impacts that can have. Um, and how that's kind of broadly stayed flat increasing for developed countries but as we bring people out of poverty around the world the effect that's having on the environment and more generally so this was a really interesting study from a couple of years ago um, i think this was mainly based in germany but certainly across the eu and what it found was that despite people's um, environmental self-identity and the fact you know what we wanted to do to help the environment that people's actual environmental impacts were best predicted by their income level. Okay, so even when we try and behave um, in a more environmentally responsible way, as a group, the biggest effect we have tends to be our income level. But again, this kind of tells us in the system we're living in, if all we're doing is bringing people um, out of poverty, are we just going to make the climate emergency worse? Okay, so what happens if we look at that in the other direction, um, kind of the flip side of the same problem? We take, say, CO2 or something like that and take the steps that we know we immediately need to do to reduce that. OK, so say we, you know, we, we ban energy polluting industries or something like that. And then in the same thing, paper that would be calling for that, then you'd see a headline. The coal industry loses 50,000 jobs in, in five years. We rapidly reduce car travel. Ford announces job cuts. Jaguar facing 90 million lost job cuts and so on. You know, even just saying that we kind of all, I think a lot of us here would feel that consumerism is something we should need to cut down on. But then the same time as that, UK consumer spending falls to a record low. And, and you know, the way our system is set up at the moment, how do we solve these, these competing issues? Um, and again, this was, I made this talk a while ago, but then this was a headline I put in just from, from last week. We're almost conducting a mini experiment in this at the moment, in the sense that, the coronavirus and our response to it has meant we've very rapidly completely slowed economic growth. Um, we're cutting down on consumption, and yet we're getting these dire warnings from the UN that just in the way we've done that, billions of people around the world are having their economic livelihoods threatened in a way that you know could be properly, properly disastrous. And so, really, um, summarizing all of that, it's just it's it, it's the classic conflict between jobs and the environment. And, you know, I don't really want to do party politics at all tonight, um, but in a sense, this is why you have separate Green and Labour parties have been, you know, both in the UK and around the world. It's that kind of classic um, green, green, red conflict. And this is, this is the situation as it is now. And then you could pick a headline like this. Um, so this is putting in the US setting, Mexico stealing factory jobs. How about we blame automation instead? And I think we've all read at some point or heard on the news, the robots are coming to take our jobs as well. Okay, so as we are at the moment, we can't even provide enough work for people and work seems to be harming the planet. What happens when robots come and start doing everything for us? Does this just, just make everything worse? Okay, so that's all the really depressing bit of the talk. Well, what if we took a step back from that and looked at things a bit differently? Okay, forget, forget how the system works, forget what money is for a bit and say, what is it we actually need 
to, to try and tackle the climate emergency, okay? So we know we need things like clean energy generation. That's, that's a given. If we're gonna be traveling less and cutting down on, on private transport and car travel, we know our towns and cities need better modes of public transport. Um, we need technologies, you know, we're, we're doing this now, if we're gonna travel, if we're gonna commute less, we probably, um, we're gonna need the technology that enable us to happen, we've got some of those now, but what if you're in a community that doesn't have decent broadband at the moment? Does that leave you completely cut off and isolated from, from the way that works and societies might change? We need to better insulate our buildings, including new builds as well. We need to plant trees, uh, real world, the landscape, things like low impact farming, okay? So we know that mechanical farming and all the problems associated with that, Taking a quote from, from low impact farming, and I can't claim this is anything I know too much about, um, but just in the intro to that, these, these things saying there, more knowledge, more labor in this, okay? Something that's better for the environment, but requires more knowledge and more labor. Well, where do we get that knowledge from? So we're gonna need green skills, okay? Some of that's learning completely new things for us as humans. Some of this is about people in my generation and the next generation, maybe learning skills we've forgotten. You know, like a few of us might still grow our own fruit and veg, but lots of us don't know how to do things like that. All, all those kind of things, how we can um, live better with our environment, their skills we need to learn again. The repair cafe, I think this is something you do in, in New Mills already. Um, fantastic initiative. One of my favorite TV shows at the moment, the, the repair shop on that or whatever it's called. Imagine one of those in every town or every village in the country making better use of the things that we have, okay? Getting rid of the use and throw away culture, use, reuse, repair, all the skills and knowledge with that. Um, and then perhaps most importantly, if all, we need to take better care of ourselves as well in this, you know, from, from life, from children, we hear about the social care crisis. Well, what does the social care crisis mean? You know, that means, that means people when we're older, it needs people looking after them. So, what do all of these things need? Okay, so action on climate change needs people and people need jobs is, is the, sub, uh, the sum up of that, okay? Or at least tasks to do, whether we define that as jobs or not. So some of the things I'd like to emphasize on this um, is that, you know, that that's to me quite a coherent package. We need to do all these things, people need to do them. If you think about the type of things I've highlighted, and one thing to make clear, these are just ideas I came up with. I'm sure yourself, you could add to this. Experts in this would, would perhaps add lots of other things. But in general, what we've got here, we've got multi-sector industries, okay? This isn't just limited to any particular skill in work. You've got things that would be big industrial projects, um, or sorry, engineering, probably more than industrial in terms of, of the energy production. But then you've got much smaller, more local scale things going on there. You've got skills that need kind of high tech research in university, but then you've got, you know, completely different things like planting trees or that. So you've got this wide, wide range. And because of this, you have a wide ranging skills. Okay. So there's going to be people from all walks of life and with all different skills are needed on this project. Okay. And finally, a thing I'd like to emphasize, and we'll probably come back to this a bit more at the end. I think there's a, there's a habit, and particularly some people in the media when they talk about these, these kind of solutions, focus very much on the, the high-end technology. You know, so this, this kind of comes out in Silicon Valley in the States, that technology is gonna save us and save us all. So clearly there's some high technology solutions here. There are, you know, making more efficient solar panels, um, the technology solutions to enable us to, to video conference and, and work from home. That's at one end. But there's also things you might call low technology solutions as part of this and all the spectrum in between. Okay. So, you know, stuff we were talking about around low impact farming. Um, and then the final thing, looking after our, ourselves. I mean, I don't know about you, but my nan probably doesn't want a robot looking after her. That, that's not kind of her vision for social care. And it's not what I'd want to see. That, that just takes people skills of a totally different kind. So 
So given all of that, if that seems like a good idea, the million dollar question then and, and the title of the talk is, well, who's going to pay for all that? You know, there's a simple, simple strategy here. We have jobs that need doing, we have people that need jobs, but who's actually going to cough up and pay the money? And I've called it the million dollar question, but actually if you read, read the headline from last year from the US, um, US side of this, and they were describing this was going to cost $93 trillion. And this was probably put out by a group that are aiming to knock the idea, so they probably overestimated that, but we're talking a huge sum of money there. Okay. And then for, for where Labour put up the idea in their last manifesto, um, and this is coming from the Daily Telegraph, so obviously someone who probably wasn't going to support it naturally. But again, if you read this article, they'd be hitting it of saying, well, this is all very nice in theory, but this is all completely unaffordable. Okay, how can we pay for any of this stuff? Okay, so that, that brings us on to the second part of the talk. Um, anyone got any kind of questions at this, this stage before I skip on? Okay. Um, so part two, how do governments spend money? I'm going to come back to the, the joke I made about not being an economist, but actually dig into this a bit more seriously here. Okay. So these are some, some quotes from Paul Romer. Um, this is not an economic outsider. This is a guy who's the senior vice president of the world bank. Um, he's won the Nobel prize for economics and he wrote an essay in 2016 that was absolutely scathing about the way macroeconomics has gone. And um, sorry, I've jumped into saying macroeconomics. By this, I mean the type of economics that advise governments, okay? So economics when we're taking things at an aggregate level. Um, and he said that for more than three decades, macroeconomics has gone backwards. It's drifting away from science, it's more interested in preserving reputations than testing their theories against reality. And it's more committed to finding friends than facts. Okay. So he's scathing about this, but all these people are the people that are advising our governments that are making decisions that are affecting our lives. And then if you dig into this a bit more uh, and you find people that have actually done research on, on precisely this issue. And the thing that comes up time and again is that, economics has become a very closed shop at the top level okay so it's the same set of people they cite themselves in their research journals they hire themselves to the same positions they pay little to no um, attention to what's happening in other social sciences so at the base of a lot of their models are an idea about how humans behave that are taking on absolutely no knowledge from the experts in those areas that actually delve into this. And so as a result, the models that they come up with that they use to advise our governments end up having no real basis in reality. And this one in the bottom left, I think is, is possibly the most damning quote of all. And these are psychological studies that, um, that has been done looking at what happens to students when they study economics in the mainstream economic courses around the world. And they find that studying economics pushes people towards the selfish extreme. So spending time with like-minded people, economic students may become convinced that selfishness is widespread and rational, or at least that giving is rare and foolish, okay? So it's this kind of, the people that are advising our society have this vision that I think is totally at odds with the way that society actually is, and certainly totally at odds with the way society needs to be if we're gonna deal with things like climate change. So what, what I'm gonna hope to do is make the claim the world desperately needs a new approach to macroeconomics um, and, and try and justify that in, in the next half hour or so. Okay, so if before I start saying all the things I disagree with, um, how about the, the kind of things that we can all agree with from the start? So how government spending works. Governments collect taxes from the population, they spend those taxes on public services. If they spend more than they tax, they have to borrow money. That borrowing adds to public debt, which forces the government to pay interest. So spending now means paying more taxes later. Okay, so we all agree with that. Well, I kind of hope if any of you know a little bit of MMT, actually, from the very start, 
this is all backwards, okay? Right back to the very basics, we're getting all of this wrong from the very start. Now that's quite a big bold claim for me to make, and it clearly puts me at odds with just about every major politician we've had in this country for the last, last couple of decades. So this is quoting George Osborne. So that description of how the, how the government works is what we can call the household budget analogy, okay? So we go back in that analogy, the income, so the way our wages when we work are income, the government's income is taxes that they collect from the population. They're spending on public services, that's their outgoing, okay? And if they spend more than they collect in tax, that puts them in debt in the same way that if you're a person or if you're a business, you get in debt the same way. So that's what I mean by the, the household budget. So George Osborne in 2010, after the financial crash, and he's talking about years of ever rising borrowing, explicitly saying, talking about a solvent household, the bills we incur as a government, the income we have to meet. And the problem is in this, by taking on this borrowing, we're saddling our children with interest. So George Osborne got replaced with Philip Hanamond. He again talks about unfunded government spending, okay? So you're like a business, you don't have the funds to match this. We've got this scary debt, trillions of pounds. We're paying out billions in interests. And again, he's telling us, we will not saddle our children with ever increasing debts. Philip Hammond gets replaced by Savage Javid. He talks about a deficit and how we need to bring this under control. But the enormous deficit meant our debt was rising. And again, this idea that all of this, we're passing on a huge burden to the next generation. So the government here, it's a household or a business. And it's having, it's not meeting the, um, the amount it needs to spend with the income it's getting in. It's needing to borrow. That borrowing is unsustainable. In case you think that's just about me picking on conservatives, we go back to the last Labour chance we had, Alistair Darling in 2009. And again, he's using slightly different language, perhaps more moderate language, but he's still talking about the budget being on a sustainable path and talking about the need to halve the current deficit. So again, the deficit here is this big problem that we have to deal with. Again, in case you think this is just about UK politics um, and to highlight this, this mindset of the government having to balance, balance the budget all the time that this is kind of an international thing. Is not to chase a, a balanced budget just for the sake of balance. My goal is how do we grow the economy, put people back to work, and if we do that, we're going to be bringing in more revenue. If we have controlled spending and we've got a smart entitlement package, then potentially what you have is balance, but it's not balanced on the backs of, you know, the poor, the elderly, students who need student loans, families who've got disabled kids. That's not the right way to balance. Our okay, so that was, that was, of course, Barack Obama. How many times in that talk did he, he mention having to balance? And he talked about the government having to bring in revenue. So the whole theme of what he was talking about was, was, you know, this needs to be done in a fair and a progressive way, but underlying it is the same idea of the government as a household or a business. So before I kind of get into why I think this is wrong, just I'd like everyone to stop and, and think for themselves a bit. Some of the questions that, you know, that it, it took me on the route to, to try to understand this better, that I don't understand why more people don't ask. If this was true, first question, if the government has to collect its taxes from the population, where do we get this money from in the first place to pay these taxes? And if they spend more than they tax and they have to borrow, well, who loans them all this money? Where did they get it from? And why, why are they doing this? Um, and particularly think about what's happened at the moment in, in the current pandemic where governments in, in the UK, the US, around the world have suddenly had to bail out industry. You know, we're paying, is it three quarters of, of workers in the UK at the moment are, are having 80% of their wages paid by the government? Suddenly this huge injection of cash that's come from the government. Where have they suddenly got all this money from? Okay. We heard it's come from borrowing, but, but who is it that's lent them this money? Okay, so this is something... 
I thought if we were doing this in the flesh, it would be quite a fun, quick little game to play. Um, it obviously can't work quite so well here, but Penny's hopefully going to help me out. So <laughs> if I do one thing tonight, um, I hope I can convince you that you never ever think of the government as being financially constrained in the same way as a household or a budget is, a uh, household or a, a business is. So I presume most people here will have had to try and arrange a loan somehow, whether that's a business loan, something for the local community, um, whether that's just getting a mortgage. Even if not all of that, have people seen the game show um, Dragon's Den? So hoping, hoping the answer is yes. So let's imagine I'm the UK government and I'm going to put my pitch to borrow some money into the dragon's den. Okay, so hi everyone, hi dragons. Um, I'm the UK government. I earn money by taxing people and spending the money on schools and hospitals. Um, so I think it's a, a nice business proposition I've got going. The only problem is I'm a little short this year, so I'm looking to borrow 41.5 billion pounds. Uh, and now Penny's going to be my, my helpful dragons for the next couple of minutes. Hi, UK government. Uh, welcome to the den. Uh, okay, uh, so you haven't made a profit this year, but tell us, how much did you make last year? Yeah, about that. Um, we did manage to collect £600 billion in taxes last year. So, you know, we've got a lot of turnover coming in. Um, but yeah, we lost, we lost £40.7 billion last year too. Uh, so you lost money this year and last. Have you ever made a profit? Oh yeah, no, yeah, we definitely have. Yes, yes. Um, in 2002. 2002 that was 16 years ago when else um well in the last 65 years okay so does anyone listening know the answer to this how many times in the last 65 years do you think the uk government has turned a profit so what we might call a surplus it's managed to collect more in a year in taxes than it's spent outgoing i've unmuted you Any guesses? Something around maybe 50, 50, 30 times higher or lower? Near a none. Near a none. <laughs> yeah. So four times. Yes, yeah, so the actual answer is eight times, okay? Eight times in 65 years. So the thing that the government always has to strive to do, um, not making a very good job of it. So, so yeah, sorry, we made, we made a profit in eight of those. Wait. My, my mute. No. Um, sorry. <laughs> Wait, you've lost money for 57 of the last 65 years. If you don't mind me asking, uh, what's your total debt? Last count, um, it was, oh, I'm muted. No, you're mute. You okay? Am I good? Yep. So, yeah, sorry, at last count, it was about £2.32 trillion. Pounds. So, you want me to lend you money, but you lost £40 billion this year and £40 billion last year, and you pretty much never turn a profit, and you're over £2 trillion in debt. I'm sorry. For those reasons, you can all join in on this bit if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in! <laughs> okay, so I don't know if any of you are thinking the answer should be I'm out, and, and really it should be, okay? Not only, not only are you all in, you're in each time, every time. We're going to look a little bit, a bit more about what government borrowing actually is, but the way, the way we government borrowing actually happens are things called debt auctions. Those auctions are always at least 150% oversubscribed, okay? So in other words, there's more than double the people. 
Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> People are queuing up to take this to take this borrowing off the government. Moreover, um, I won't do this as an interactive thing. I would if we were live. But if anyone knows what the current interest rate on government debt is, so on a 30-year bond at the moment with the government, so that's you give them your money for 30 years, earning some interest on it, that earns 0.66% interest. Okay, that's below the rate of inflation. So you're almost actually losing money by lending it to them. So why on earth do we do this? Well, why does this keep happening? And again, this isn't just a UK thing. Same rates in the US. So the rates are even lower in Japan. And Japan has a debt to GDP ratio. So this is one of the things that we are told we should be most scared about, how high government debt is relative to our overall GDP. Japan has this insane debt to GDP ratio of 200%. And yet they have exactly the same situation. The whole private sector, given the choice, each time, every time, lends the government money. Okay. So if there's one thing I want you to take away, the government cannot be like any other household or business you nor I run, okay? And it isn't. But yet that's exactly the way that every single chancellor that we've had for the last, whatever, 15 years, that's the same way Barack Obama, the same way pretty much every politician in the developed world talks about their governments in a way that quite simply isn't true. So this point at the start about us not being able to engage in economics. Well, I would argue a big part of that is because from the very start, we're told about things in a way that simply isn't and can't be true. Okay, so I hope I've carried you with me this far. So what I'm gonna try and skim through very quickly um, are a set of diagrams that I really like that actually try and get our sense of where money comes from um, in a better way. It's gonna be a trick to do it quickly, but I'm using some, um, some beautiful slides created by an American architect called J.D. Alt. Um, so I will put a link to the end so you can see the full thing. But his, his kind of vision, and I really like it, is to think about money flowing around the economy as water and pots and taps. Okay, so they're, they're quite an intuitive thing. So if we started with this um, and we had the government as a business, um, analogy or the government as a household analogy. What we've got is us, the private sector at the top. So that's you, me, that's all the businesses around that, that have the pounds. The government is a pot at the bottom and it gets its income by taxing us. So that's the tax tap or what it can't get from taxes, it borrows from us. Okay, so pounds originate with us, they come through taxes and go down to spending or they go through borrowing and go into spending. That's, that's the basic model. And of course, the problem with this is, is going back to, you know, all the things those chancellors were telling us. Taxes can't take too many pounds out of the private sector. OK, because we if they do tax rates go up, we won't vote for the government. We'll vote them out. Um, the other story you hear a lot is, you know, we try and put taxes up on rich people too much. All the businesses and rich people will leave the country. OK, so. You see headlines like this all the time. This was a particularly extreme one from just before the last election. The super rich will prepare to leave the UK within minutes if Labour wins the election. OK, and the idea underlining that is saying, well, there's only so much tax you can ever take. So in economics, there's this theory called the Laffer curve. And the idea of this is you've got. You can try and set your tax rates that's going along the bottom. But above some point, the more you try and tax, the less you get back because either people find ways to get around the tax or because all the businesses leave your country. OK, now you can argue whether this is true or not, but this is certainly something that, that people believe. And it's a, you know, a necessary part of how we've set the model up. So that says we can't tax so much. But what we can't get in tax, we have to borrow. But of course, we have to limit the number of pounds we borrow from the private sector. Because we have to pay that back. OK. And of course, as well as paying it back, we have to pay interest on it. And so if we're paying out too much in interest, then we're in this vicious cycle where we have to try and collect more in tax than we can safely take out. You know, and this is that, that same idea that borrowing more now 
means taxes are going to have to go up in the future. So when we set the model up like this, it means that as essential spending, so things like core NH services, if pensions get locked in, all of those things in the US, they call these things entitlements. Okay, so as those, any of those go up, that automatically means that discretionary spending has to go down. Okay, so environmental projects, then all the other things that we've seen cut in in the last few years. Okay. And that's a necessary result of there being this fixed scarce amount of money that the government is able to extract from all of us. And then, of course, where do we get all these pounds from? Well, occasionally you hear about us having to borrow money from abroad. OK, so apparently China owns all our debts. They're lending us all the money. And if we have to keep doing this, this just this bankrupts us. OK, this is what's happening to us as a country. This is why we're losing the global race whatever that may be. So what does this effect have on our everyday lives? Okay, when we set it up like this. So because of this, our governments are were broke, okay? And I don't know if people recognize this, this was the famous letter Liam Byrne left at the end of the, the Gordon Brown administration with that, I'm afraid there is no money left. Best regards and good luck. So it made a famous appearance again in the 2015 election debates. It was apparently a bit of a joke, but, but that kind of summed it up. Um, George Osborne, because he, he told us this at the time, the UK has run out of money. Barack Obama was telling us the American government was broke and was given credit for at least being candid there. The UN has run out of money. And so if all the governments have run out of money, then we can't have the things we need just to keep going. Okay, so, you know, things, cuts to our, our NHS, things in our local services. The budget, you always hear about budget black holes and it's causing, I don't know, green bin fiasco. We're having to cut lollipop services, sure start, start, sure start centres, children's services, libraries closing, sports budgets, leisure centres. Okay, all of these things all comes back to the same argument. The politicians aren't telling us we want to close these things, we think they're a rubbish idea, get rid of them, but they're saying we don't have a choice. We've run out of money. If we don't want to saddle our children with unsustainable debt, we have to make these hard choices now. And then as a result of those, then we start seeing the headlines about, you know, what's happening to our, to our kids that don't get these opportunities. And then we bring that back to the environment. Well, how can we even begin to start trying to make some of those changes we said we need to, to make to our energy systems to those if they're going to be expensive and they're going to cost us something to do now and we're going to pay people to do them if we've run out of money? So that's one side of things. Second effect that's perhaps a bit more subtle is that we have to accept bad things. Okay, so when we have this model of, of the government being constrained by money, it means we're entirely reliant on the private sector and the money they spend to keep us afloat as society. So that effectively allows big business to hold us all as society to ransom and to hold the environment to ransom. So again, these are, these are things I've just picked from local papers, um, the other side of Manchester from us, but up in Wigan, huge business park creating 1600 jobs will be built on Greenbelt land. OK, despite massive opposition. So the opposition is this is, you know, it, it's taken away Greenbelt land. It's bad for the environment, but it gets planning permission because this thing is creating us jobs. Again, this was more towards altering and some airport plans set for approval. Again, same thing, Greenbelt concerns. When you read about how the people that want to frack and do stuff like that, the arguments a lot of the time they're making is the economic benefits behind it. Another airport one, this was from, from literally just this week. I don't know if people saw the news about Heathrow being allowed to appeal against the third runway block. And again, picking the quote from, from this article, the Heathrow spokesman stressed that it's a privately funded project. So they're pumping billions of pounds into the economy and they're creating thousands of jobs. OK, so we basically we need them to do that because that's what society relies on. And again, just to highlight, this isn't just a UK thing, this is America. 
being pleased with coal. Scott Morrison, the Australian Prime Minister, defending the coal industry. The country's on fire, but hey, we're not going to write off the jobs of thousands of Australians. So overall, the government acting like a business is really not very good for society. Okay, and I may be, again, in March, when I was kind of putting, finalising these things, there was sort of talk that governments were going to behave a bit differently, certainly in this country. Boris Johnson was talking about a big spending splurge in infrastructure spending. We can argue about whether we think what they were going to spend on was a good idea or not, but maybe the idea that austerity was perhaps over was something being talked about. And then, of course, everything that's happened has happened. And this came out yesterday. And we're back to square one again. OK, so we've had this huge 300 billion pound bill. How are we going to pay for all of this? Well, the only way we can pay for it is to try and get more money in tax, the so tax rises, and we're going to have to pay out less money so public sector pay freezes again. When you, when you, when you look here, I think if you guys can see the bottom of the screen, the word in here is forced again. OK, it's this narrative. We don't want to do this. This isn't a policy choice. It's something we have to do because of the economics. So is any of that an accurate diagram of how modern money actually works? OK, so the first thing we have to notice about our diagram is that we got something, we missed out something very important. And that's where all this money that gets spent from the governments, whether that's their direct spending, the interest on their payments, that has to go somewhere, right? So it, it gets paid to somebody. And the people it gets paid to is us, right? So the UK government buys its goods and services from UK citizens and businesses. You know, when you pay a doctor's or a nurse's or a teacher's wage, that spends money. They might be paid directly from the government, but they spend that money into the private sector just like anyone else. Interest on a bond ultimately gets goes back into the private sector and comes back into the private economy. OK, so these pounds circulate back round. So that's important, to say the least. But the second thing that isn't addressed, we never answered that first question we had. of Where do we get this money from in the first place? OK, we're still talking about we spend it taxes into them and then they can spend it back to us. But did it really originate from us in the first place? OK, so part three, what actually is modern money? So if we were being technical about what the UK government is, it's the sovereign monopoly issuer of a fiat currency, and that's pound sterlings. So taking those words in turn, what they actually mean is sovereign, possessing supreme or ultimate power. Monopoly the exclusive possession or control of the supply of a trade or a commodity or a service. And fiat, a formal authorization or proposition, a decree. Okay, so putting that into slightly more everyday language, what that means, the government has sovereign power, it has ultimate power, it has the monopoly, so it's the only person that can create pounds sterling. And moreover, the fiat side of it means it just does that by decree, okay? It creates pounds, as and when it wants to, and it has the full and ultimate authority to do that. Okay, so pounds ultimately come from the government. Any of us doing that, if we try to create our own pounds, ultimately that's called counterfeiting money and sees you land in jail. Second point to note, I'm not going to have any time to talk about foreign trade tonight, um, but pound sterling and all modern fiat currencies are what are called non-convertible free floating currencies. Okay. So the non-convertible thing is the really important point here. You can't get pounds from anything else, okay? You can't turn dollars into pounds. You can exchange them, that's what a foreign exchange market is, but that just means person A has pounds and they swap them with person B who has dollars and the two swap over, okay? The pounds still, in the first place, can only get created by the UK government. So if that's the case, then how did they ever get into the private sector pot in the first place? Okay, so the reality is government's fiat pounds have to get created first and they have to spend them to all of us for us to have them, for them to tax them back. 
So in other words, our diagram all this time has been upside down. OK. Government's on top. They spend. Then they, we can pay our taxes. That still doesn't really tell us what pounds actually are, though. It's this kind of conceptual thing. Governments create them. What do they create? So we all understand what an I, IOU is, right? So this is something any of us can create for anyone else. So if I made this IOU, this is me promising to give you a hug, a nice socially isolated, respectful distance hug, but a hug when you present this IOU to me. And when I give you that hug, that gets cancelled. So that's actually all pound stolen are, okay? All money really is, is just an IOU from the government. But what is it they owe us and what actually gives them value? Okay, if these things are just created out of thin air, why do all of us use them all the, all the time? Why are we all chasing this money? And we don't really ever think of it like this because the reason I use pounds is because you use pounds and the reason you use pounds is because Penny uses pounds. And so all of us are gonna use this as our currency. The basic reason that any of us actually need it is because the government have the authority to require us to pay something to them on a regular basis, okay? And that of course is our taxes. So this is really where taxes fit into, into the model of a modern economy. And taking that further, we as societies have given our governments the authority, ultimately, if we don't pay our taxes, to chase us through the courts and ultimately put us in jail. Okay, we don't normally end up in jail for bankruptcy, but certainly as companies, you know, if any of those who follow football, whenever you see a football club get wound up, it isn't the private debts they owe, ultimately it's HMRC, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, they serve the winding up body because that company isn't able to pay its tax. Well, you as a person end up having to bankrupt yourself as an individual. So because of that, because we need to be able to get pounds from the government, that drives the value for all of us, okay? So some of us will always serve, sell our, our time, our services, our goods to the government, so we can get money from them to pay our taxes. And at the same time, that then drives the value for other people to want to earn money from us by providing public sector workers with goods and services so they can get their tax money to pay off this debt to the government. So taxes drive the whole currency along. So that's what that looks like in our diagram, okay? The pounds issued by the government are just IOUs with each one saying, I, the UK government, owe you, the bearer of this pound, one pound's worth of council taxes. So when we pay our taxes on the other side, the government fulfills its side of the bargain, the IOU, the taxes are marked paid, and the IOU gets cancelled. Okay, this is what's happening every moment of every day when spending occurs, when taxes get paid. So the next thing then to try and get this diagram right is we have to ask, well, what's actually the point of that tax going back to the government if it's just an IOU that the government can create any time they want? Okay, why is it harvesting something it can create at any time? What, what's the point of that? And bear in mind, I'm showing this as physical cash here. Of course, we know these days it's mainly numbers on spreadsheets, 90% of the time whizzing round. Why is the government harvesting these tax money back if it can just freely create money whenever it wants? And the answer is it doesn't, okay? Taxes do not go back to the government. An accurate diagram of what money looks like in a modern economy is this. Government issues its tax IOUs. It spends them into the private sector. And then taxes just drain these out the bottom of the economy, okay? Canceling the IOUs. Anytime the government needs to spend again, it creates new money. Anytime it taxes, that's a tax drain that gets taken away at the bottom. So now we've got our diagram, right? We can start talking about a few more realistic things of the way that taxes behave, okay? So the first thing we've already said is that they 
drive the whole value. They're what make us want to earn these pounds in the first place. The second thing is that if we manage to convince our government that we should stop paying taxes for any reason, pretty soon in this, that private sector part, so all of us, we become overflowing with money. You know, if the government keeps spending money into us, buying services, and then doesn't take any of that money off us in tax, we just keep getting more and more money without creating any more goods in the economy. And then that money chasing those goods is what we call inflation. Okay, so in this diagram, you can kind of visually see that as the pot starting to overflow. So without continuously removing those pounds from the pot through a tax drain, governments can't continue to issue and spend its tax, okay? Otherwise they create inflation. So questions of who pays taxes, how much, which businesses and services should do, that's kind of a whole separate topic for discussion. But that doesn't mean that there's any excuse for not getting this right in our diagram in the first place, okay? So the next important question then is what's happened to our borrowing tap? Okay, so that, that was here before. Um, we don't have that in our final diagram. So should we put it back and, and clearly, you know, I, I made the point earlier, governments do not borrow in any way like a household or a business, but they certainly do something that we term borrowing money. So why does the UK government borrow money? The truth is it doesn't really, at least not in the sense that we think about it, okay? What it does, it sells government bonds. So for us, the banks, for pension funds that actually do the government, that buy the government bonds, buying a government bond is just an asset swap from the private sector, okay? So you start with something that doesn't pay interest. So this is cash sitting in deposit accounts. And then you buy a government bond, which in terms is them, is you lending them your cash, you give them a fixed amount of time. In return, you hold a bond that pays out a set amount of interest, okay? So what happens is that pounds are transferred from this private sector pot into what we can call the government bond savings account where they earn interest, okay? So that's, that's this step here. This is where borrowing comes back in now. And a government bond says they must stay for a specified period of time. So when I talked before about that thing that earned 0.66% interest, that was a 30 year bond, but you get one year bonds, two year bonds, and so on, different length things. And actually what happens, any money that isn't spent, um, that isn't, sorry, taxed from the private sector pot, the government sells enough bonds so that we can always swap that to drain that money out of the private sector pot, okay? So the effect of that is a very large number of pounds effectively gets sequestered into what we call the government bond savings account here or government borrowing. The thing that's important to note on this, when we talk about this being borrowing, okay, when that bond matures, when the time is up, all that happens is the government creates those pounds back into thin air again, just transfers them straight back into the private sector pot okay there's nothing onerous about this from the government's point of view it's not some scary thing they're saddled with it's literally numbers on one spreadsheet get transferred back to numbers on another spreadsheet okay and actually more often than not they just go straight back again so the person just rolls over their bond to a new one because the fact they saved that money in the first place meant that they probably didn't want to spend it on anything else and so they may as well have it back as a government bond that earns interest. So when we come back to this I'm in thing, hopefully you can maybe see a bit now why everyone is in every time, okay? So what you've got here is basically free money. If you've got cash savings, and we're talking you know, a large business or a pension fund, you don't just leave them sitting around in bank deposit accounts. Apart from anything else, they're not insured above 80,000 pounds. Okay, so they're not guaranteed. So you're basically parking them with the government, the ultimate safest place they can be. And they earn interest that they wouldn't get otherwise. Free money for you. Okay, now that interest might be lower than it would if you put that in a more risky investment. 
that any other way of investing that money is by definition risky. You're putting it into some stocks and shares, something else that you can potentially lose. The 100% cast iron guaranteed place that cannot lose money is giving it to the government because by definition, the government can always have an infinite amount of those pounds that it will create back. Okay? The UK government will never default on pounds. The US will never default on dollars. Okay? Or at least they never need to. They could have a stupid president in charge that might try and default on that, but they can't. There's no practical reason for them ever to do that. So then a fair question might be, why do we call this borrowing and why do governments do it? Um, again, I don't have time to answer these in full. Why they do it is largely for historical reasons. Um, and when we talk about MMT, the modern in that has a very specific meaning. Um, and it was a change in the way that international currencies operated against each other in the 70s, what was called the end of the Bretton Woods Agreement. And so before that time, we kind of had fixed exchange rates between each other. Um, and so there were reasons for creating interest bearing debt in this way in terms of how one currency played off against each other. So mainly this is just the legacy of those. The reason we call this borrowing is I don't know if we've got any accountants listening, but if you added this up in an accounting sense, it kind of has the properties of a loan. Okay, If you look at the way the assets and the liabilities lie, it's a liability of the government. This bond is an asset of us in the same way that a loan between a person and a bank might be. The massive difference, of course, is that the liability for the government is in something that it can create. Okay, So it owes pounds, but it's not really an onerous debt because it can always create them at any point. So the final thing I need to address before we can get back to the Green New Deal, does it really make sense for our government here to be a pot at all? Okay, There are no pounds flowing into this if you look at our new, our new diagram. So we've got government creating money, we've got spending that into the private sector pot, we've got the private sector pot flying back and forward between this government bond account, but nothing ever actually goes back into the government. Okay because as we know, it's got no need to harvest these IOUs it can create any time it wants. So really the best way to think of a government and government spending is just this sovereign currency issuing machine. Okay, it just sits there at the top, generating money, and then having the authority to levy taxes, which causes a demand for that money, and make sure at the same time as well, that not too much of it ends up in the pot, which gives them the space to keep spending on the services that governments, governments want to take, okay? But the remarkable thing about this when we think about it, okay? So in the old model, government spending, it was sort of, yeah, it was a necessary thing that the public wants, but it was also something that the whole time it was, it was almost a bad thing, okay? The more governments spend, the worse the finances they, they have. When we think of it in the correct way, the government is actually paying all of us to then create goods and services which we all collectively benefit from. So uh, JD Alt says these are quite difficult to, to put in his diagram, but you know, all of these things, the things we were told we had to cut, the lollipop ladies, sure start centers, NHS, all of that, not only do we benefit from those services, the money spent on them collectively makes us richer as a nation. Okay, that's money coming to all of us flowing around the private sector. So he diagrams it like this, and I, I really like this. Okay, so all of that sovereign spending creates these collective goods and services that the whole rest of this machinery sits on. That's kind of what society is. This is the, you know, the pact we all have with each other. And so really, government spending underpins and supports the whole of the private economy. Let's just very quickly go back to this the household budget and, and look at all the scary things that Barack Obama and George Osborne and all the other chancellors were telling us about. So we've already seen what government borrowing is and why we don't really need to be scared of that. What about balance? Barack Obama's balance, balance, balance. What's a, a balanced budget or the deficit or the national, the national debt? So we now think of this over a year. So in a balanced budget, the government spends into the private sector, the same amount it drains out in taxes. That's by definition what a balanced budget is. 
Okay, so we've got some level of savings at the start on the left hand side, some amount of spending is coming in, and then that being drained out. And of course, these processes happening every second of every day, but add that up over the whole year. A balanced budget means they've just drained out whatever they've put in. Okay, so by definition, we have no more savings than we started. So why is that something they particularly want to do? You know, why would it be a bad idea for us to be able to have savings? Even worse, so the holy grail, the budget surplus, this thing that you know we've only managed to achieve eight times in 65 years, and I say achieve because apparently that's the goal all the time of the government. So over the year cycle then, that just means it's managed to drain out more in taxes than it's spent into the economy. So very clearly, you can see the only way that can happen is by us across the whole private sector having collectively spent some of our savings so we end up with less savings than we started with. And you might think, well, that would be OK, you know, if that's some rich guy in the Cayman Islands and we're taking taking his taxes to pay for that. But of course, we know the way that gets distributed around the economy isn't the way that happens. What pretty much always happens in this case is that burden falls on the people who can least afford it in society. The only way they make up for it is by taking on more private debt. Which they can't pay off. And then so if we're lucky, we'll get a full banking. Well, we almost certainly get a, re a recession. So if you look through pretty much every time you get a sustained budget surplus for any length of time, you end up with a private sector recession. And with a bit of luck, you get a full blown banking crisis like in 2008. So then the opposite of all of this, hopefully you can see where this is going. And I stress the word chooses here. OK. So one of the things in all the austerity is the government was always targeting the surplus, but it never managed to get there. And that's because the government actually can't choose that position, right? Because we make the choice on what money we save. The government can nudge us in certain ways and effectively by making us all poorer, ultimately we get to the point where we can't even afford to save any money and we take on more private debt. But ultimately the choice relies with us what money we save, okay? So if we save more in a year than they text back out, that, of course, is the deficit. This thing that they kept screaming at and the newspapers keep screaming at us as being this disastrous thing. Is actually just our savings. So far from being a disastrous thing, it's probably an entirely necessary thing for us. OK, and very finally, so what's our national debt? And I had the uh, I had this here. I, this has now gone up, as I said, to about two over two trillion pounds. That's just the accumulated deficits over all the years. Okay, so we save this money, we take it from non-interest bearing cash, we save it in government bond savings. That's all the government debt is. Okay, far from being this scary thing, it's all just our collective savings that we've built up over the years. And it never needs to get paid back by anyone. So finally, finally, we can talk about how government spending really works. OK, get rid of the household budget crap. This is what happens. Step one, underneath all of this that we kind of forget about because it's, it's just there in the background. The fact that we as society authorise our government to collect taxes. That's the pact we all make. OK, we do this because we think they're going to spend those monies into existence and spend those on things that are of benefit to all of us. When that money comes to us, we then use those pounds in our everyday transactions. And each time we pay for something, each time we get our wages, a little bit of that gets taxed away from us. Okay, every time you spend on something, VAT gets taken off, that tax drains away. Any of that that we choose to save, then doesn't get taxed away. If it's sat in my account being saved, doesn't get taxed, it results in an accumulation of non-interest bearing assets. We swap those for government bonds that pay interest. And each year, the amount we save gets recorded as a deficit. Together, those deficits add up to be the national debt. OK, now, sorry if I rushed through that a bit. I, I'm aware the time is getting on. Um, that was your whistle stop introduction to modern monetary theory. I hope you found it interesting. Um, I hope it's made you think a bit differently about about all the things you've perhaps been told in the media and maybe helps you see things differently and hopefully something will learn more, you know, you'll want to learn more about in the future. Okay, very quickly, some things I didn't mention in there. 
private banking. Um, JD Alt does mention that in his, his video, I'd urge you to watch it. Yes, if you're thinking I'm lying when I say only the government creates pounds, technically that sort of is true, because I don't have time to go into the difference between private bank created credit versus currency. But banks have two very important roles. They manage the balance of payment systems and they make repayable bank loans, okay? They're both vital things. They don't really change anything I'm gonna talk about in this. Happy to discuss more in the questions or later. Foreign trade, again, people think, okay, what you've said domestically seems fine, but don't those domestic deficits just add up and I've heard about the trade deficit, doesn't that collapse value of the pound? Okay, no, nope. trade deficit are just pound savings held by foreigners, nothing more, nothing less. Very often they're held by foreign governments. Again, happy to explain more later. It changes nothing about what I'm gonna say next about the Green New Deal, most specifically, Domestic deficits do not collapse the value of the pound. Okay, final important point. I didn't really talk about the distribution of money or savings or how that planned out. Okay, so a domestic deficit is almost certainly necessary. Okay, for us as a whole as the private sector, that has to happen. But really even more important than that is who holds those savings. And so part of the thing about, you know, the inequality we're all seeing is the fact that of course those savings are being distributed in a really unequal way across society. So as a result of that, you can't just look at a deficit and say it's good or bad, or a larger deficit is better because that means more savings, because what really counts is how it's distributed. But the flip side of that is also true. You still don't need to worry about the deficit itself as a thing, okay? What you need to do is fix the inequality and the deficit will just be whatever it is. So right, I'll try and sum up fairly quickly so we can hopefully maybe 10 more minutes and then we can all start asking questions. So once we've got this diagram correct, okay, the thing we're really saying, what limits our collective accomplishments, us as a country, what we can afford, is never limited by the number of pounds the government can tax or borrow, okay? The government has an unlimited amount of money it can spend. But of course, an MMT is very, very clear on this. So if you hear about MMT in the literature, it always just starts with that first fact. MMT says governments can spend infinitely. What we always stress even more so is yes, but we always face real limits, okay? So we have a real resource limit. The government can only spend money on goods and services, okay? If it just tries to spend more than that, all it can do is push up the price of existing things. So it's never limited by money. So it should never have an excuse not for making full use of the real resources available to it. But we do always need to think about what those limits are. Okay, so what are those real resources? Well, first and most obviously people, okay? It, it sounds a bit cold and a bit economic to talk about people as being a resource, but that's what we are, you know? We're, we're the most incredible, machine on earth we can do all these amazing things for the planet around us for each other we can do destructive things as well but they're a resource that we can all the government can use we all use ourselves okay so physical resources land water sand precious metals but then most importantly in terms of green ideas and that what doesn't really get accounted for in our current economics properly is our ecological budget okay and this is what you know the donut economics diagram is telling us we have this kind of fixed budget there that we know we now can't expand beyond so that's a limit we always need to live within but a stress again the government is never financially constrained the limits are always these real things okay so coming back to dawn french and and her point at the start and was this a silly childish question well actually no it wasn't at all i mean it was actually <laughs> You know, it was a perfectly fair thing to say and, and government shouldn't be in recession. If that means people going poor and not being able to do something because we've run out of money, well, that's just a ridiculous situation to ever, ever find ourselves in. So what about the Green New Deal and all these things that, that we said we wanted? Okay, and I've seen there's some, some chat in here um, about maybe, you know, some of these things you think are good ideas or not. But like I said, you bring your own ideas, Experts can tell us in climatology what they think we need. Can we do all these things now? Okay, we've got the money. Can we do them all? And what I'd say is, well, 
there's probably a chance we can't do everything immediately okay and so the way i i think and the way the green new deal talks about thinking about this think if we could organize these on a critical need and nice to have and again you might disagree with the order i've put them in on here that's kind of really near the hair but you can imagine there is some there is some ordering and so what we need to do the things on the critical list the things that you know we've got our 12 years left to to properly transform our whole economies before before we reach climate tipping points we just need to crack on and fund these okay no more talk about running out of money we do this now so the only real question there is do we have the real resources and if not how do we make them available okay so this is now where we can see this is now a coherent policy because things like you know banning the uh, environmentally unsustainable industries banning cars all the workers, all the people involved in that, we can then do our best to retrain, redeploy, where possible, reuse existing, um, you know, existing factories if we can make use of those. Whatever it takes, that's what we have to do now. Okay, direct government intervention, make this happen, make it happen now. And then a the question: well, Do we need more taxes to do this? And this is a kind of interesting one. Um, things to be clear on we do not need taxes to raise revenue for any of this that's the thing to be absolutely clear on if ever there's an excuse for bringing in a tax on any of these things it's only ever to try and free up one of these real resources okay so in other words by putting a tax on something you potentially disincentivize someone to use that which frees up that resource for the government for us as society to be able to use that but that's more likely to be targeted on very specific things very very specific industries okay but that tax is absolutely not about raising revenue if it comes in. So the next question is what you can call the matching problem. Okay. So is it then realistic to expect everyone currently unemployed, all the people that have gone through all the hardship that we talked about around the world, and then anyone further made unemployed by restricting environmentally unsustainable industry will be suitably employed in one of these critical projects we're going to fund now? Okay. And the answer is obviously probably not okay a part of this is just a geographic thing you know if you if you've got an unemployed person say in in manchester and you need an electric engineer in northern scotland to to have a new wind farm or something up there you can't suddenly turn that you know an unemployed person in manchester into an electrical engineer in scotland okay you can do your best to retrain people but you've got that you've got that matching issue so then, well, how about this is a simple idea. All those things that we have on our nice to have list, just list them as jobs, okay? Available to anyone that wants them. Our aim is to have that list as wide as possible, to take people as they are and where they are, take the skills they've got and match their skills to any of those jobs, okay? Pay them to do it, pay them fairly to do it at a living wage. And when we start thinking like this, to me, this totally redefines our notion of work okay work stops being something that's environmentally damaging work stops being something that's about you know us having just to give up our time working for the man or whatever it's about us saying well what skills have i got and if i don't have a job if the private sector doesn't need me well how can i contribute those skills to everyone around me which is good for me good for my local society okay so this is the Green New Deal job guarantee. The thing I'd like to stress on this, it's not an optional extra for part of the Green New Deal, it's right in the very heart of it, okay? So as much as the big, you know, the, those big projects, the big public infrastructure projects, projects are part of the Green New Deal, at the very heart is this idea of jobs in our local communities that we can all work on. So summarizing that, it's government funded, it's paid at a fixed living wage, available to anyone anywhere, targeted to be sustainable, environmentally beneficial. Okay, so not all of them necessarily will be direct environmental jobs, but at the very least, they shouldn't be environmentally damaging. Okay, they should be locally administered because communities decide what jobs they need. Okay, you, you in New Mills know what you need best. Jen, you in, Lang in Preston, you know what Preston needs best. The people need that. But ideally, they should probably be in the nice to have category. OK, and those things might in turn, might in time 
translate into something that are a more permanent part of everything we do and become a full-time public sector job say um but the point in the first place is there you know if it was critical we probably need to be doing it now and not just relying on on people that might take these jobs up okay and critically we match people's jobs to the skills and not vice versa so just very very quickly why a job guarantee and not ubr universal basic income which this always comes up um and it always comes up when you talk about mmt because people think well if you're talking about governments can't run out of money then surely ubi is the way to go okay i'm not going to go into this in detail but there are some very strong economic reasons why it's pretty impossible to have the universal part of the ubi ever work at the level that people talk about it wanting to behave okay because if you ever set it high enough to be truly transformative to do all the stuff people say about okay i can choose not to work and therefore um we stop getting exploitative employment to pay that at a level to everyone across the economy means injecting so much cash you would completely destabilize your economy okay we're back back in those diagrams it's not just slightly overfilling your private sector pot you are literally flooding it in a completely unprecedented way the outcome of that will always hurt the poorest people in your society most okay the people you're trying to help get hurt by that economic destabilization more than anyone because of that all the universal basic income schemes you ever see actually proposed never talk about paying when you look at the details anywhere close to something that would be near the living wage okay they're always like a third of it a fifth of it but to make that low enough to be economically stable you then don't actually have any of the transformative impacts of what you're trying to do okay so if you're unemployed and your ubi isn't near the living wage you still stay in poverty if you're in a job at the moment that's not you know poverty wages all the ubi is doing is acting as a wage subsidy for those exploitative employers it's not actually giving you the power to turn those employers down and they still have that power over you that there's this big pool of unemployed poverty people underneath them which is why they can keep exploiting you in in the current way okay you flip that around to the job guarantee you direct that money rather than universally directly to the people that need it most you set a wage floor for the whole economy you take away that whole jobs ransom from the large corporations okay so you do the transformative things that you hope your ubi can do you just do it in a sustainable way um, and some stuff in an auto stabilizer that i'm not going to cover more here okay talking about that's just economics that's kind of the cold hard facts in terms of what this means for the community and the environment the ubi you can think of it it's effectively a no strings attached consumer token now you or i because of our beliefs may very well think well that means i'll give up a bit of work and i can spend more time being environmentally sustainable i can keep bees and grow my allotment but there's absolutely nothing in it to stop someone buying a range rover or going skiing or doing all the other environmentally destructive hyper consumerist things we have okay you've got no strings attached to that now that's sort of true of the jg as well the job guarantee but at least you're spending in the first place directed on beneficial projects and you're also targeting that to the areas of the country that need it most rather than just flooding the whole country rich areas poor areas all with the same amount of cash okay, and last but not least on this i think there's a feeling sometimes that by talking about people having to have a job you're putting all the onus on them okay you're talking about kind of moral worth ethics i don't think you should have money unless you do a job but in the way the job guarantee is set up i think you flip that round okay you're talking about giving someone the chance to make their skills useful to society and there's lots of environmental research that show that that is beneficial to people so i actually think this puts the onus on us in society to provide a framework for everyone to be part of okay i think of this a bit like i don't think anyone's ever you know the first time say my generation and we we cook christmas dinner and we're control freaks the first time around right we do it all ourselves and we we leave our mother-in-law out of it and we think we're kind of you know giving them a rest but actually you realize in a bit giving a job to someone makes them feel part of that day or you know planning a wedding i'll give your father-in-law something to do it will make him happy okay that 
we kind of know this ourselves in small groups. Well, that's true and psychologically shown to be true across societies. Okay, so the very final thing on this, there will of course be people, um, and particularly more so because of the long-term unemployment we've had and, and you know, the way neoliberalism liberalism has worked, who even given the choice of a job guarantee, um, wouldn't be able to take it. Okay, I'm not talking here about general disability allowances, of course, all of that would absolutely remain and, and would be hopefully done in a far fairer way than it's been turned into the last 10 years. But people that otherwise have um, alcohol, substance abuse issues and stuff, again, they might not be able to take the job guarantee, but you've actually now helped identify those people in a far better way than you ever can with the UBI, okay, where you just send a check in the post and hope that they can cope and get on with it. So anyone that can't take a job guarantee, that's then up to us as society to try and fight for them and fight for their rights to get them the help they need. Okay, so sorry, get off my soapbox now about the UBI and the, the job guarantee. So finally, finally, how do we pay for a Green New Deal? So the answer for that is the government will type some numbers into a computer. Okay, get my cat to do it for us. Okay, bit of a flip and glib answer, that that is the right answer if the question is how do you finance a green new deal it literally will be the government will authorize the spending and type some numbers into a computer but the actual question how do you pay for a green new deal okay what we really pay for it and what we really mean is we'll pay for it with people okay so everyone working on a green new deal project can't be working somewhere else in the private sector so do we have enough people to do that the materials we need for that Okay, the things we don't get to have, that's how we pay for a Green New Deal. Okay, if I, if we have to stop flying, that was something, you know, I was lucky enough, I've got to travel around the world as a youngster. If that's unsustainable, that's a thing I don't get to do or my kids in the future don't get to do. That's, that's how we pay for it. And then the question, well, maybe this costs us some of our environmental budget. Okay, so we end up having to spend a bit of, of what little environmental budget we've got left to try and transform our economies into something more sustainable. So these are difficult, tough questions, but they're better conversations that we need to be having. Okay. So finally, just to maybe preempt or tempt a couple of questions out, things you might hear about this, criticism of the Green New Deal, it, it, it's too radical. Okay. So we already live in an MMT world. So when I talk about how governments spend, that's not some new radical thing. That is how it is now. We just don't describe it as such. Okay, at least the media doesn't describe it as such. The second thing, we know large scale mass mobilizations in the past have been successful. That, that's what the New Deal is based on. We've seen it like for the way we transformed a whole economy to fight the Second World War. Okay? I don't particularly like war analogies, but actually it's the perfect example of how pretty much a whole country overnight transformed everything we did for one aim, and that was to get us through the Second World War. And then six years later in 1946, transformed the whole, whole economy back again and built the NHS and built the welfare state. So we, we can do this. What we had then was a government willing to do it and a population initially united against a common cause in, in fighting, fighting the war, and then united in a common cause that if you know, if working people have had this much destruction given upon them, well, why shouldn't we have health care and a welfare state? OK, so we can do it. And finally, it can't be too radical because, you know, the climate isn't giving us a choice. We have to do something radical. We have to do something now. Flipping it the other way, you might hear, well, this doesn't challenge government power, OK? We, we can't trust the government. That's certainly true. But ultimately, we've given the government they have that power now, okay? So, you know, the transition movement has to start with what you've got. Currencies work in this way. So we either need to challenge government power and make this work for us, or at least understand the system so we can change it to something different. Working less, not more. Again, I think if you redefine work, you still have to live. Why is leisure any less, any more environmentally destructive than work, okay? Redefine work, make work not environmentally destructive. Doesn't address hyper consumerism, promotes the status quo. Okay, well, that, they're possibly true. But actually, I think 
away from the kind of mechanics of MMT, the more pr profound vision it can help give you is that really it's never the money that matters, it's always the real things, okay? So this diagram comes not from the MMT literature, but more from the, um, the, the um, kind of Kate Roth's work and donut economics and, and the different visions of an economy. So on the left is what we have now, the idea that we have an economy and we the people and the planet, we serve that economy, okay? So we have to sacrifice things to maintain its health. What the progression vision of is of course the truth. It's, you know, the planet is a thing, it doesn't care about the economy. We, the people, sit in this planet. So ultimately, it's up to us to create an economy that serves us, that's sustainable for the planet and good for us. OK, and then nicking these quotes again from from Kate Roth. She talks about this being economies that grow, whether or not they make us thrive. And this being economies that make us thrive, whether or not they grow. Now, if that's the vision, what MMT shows us is how you can actually do that in a mechanical sense, okay? You know, the underlying tools, how we can make these tools drive our society to meet that vision. So I think that actually really is a big, profound, radical, different way of looking at things. Finally, what we can all do. First of all, yes, this puts an emphasis on government, big infrastructure things, stuff that comes from there, it relies on government funding. That doesn't mean any of this is in any sense not compatible with all the amazing work you guys are already doing in your local communities okay so keep doing all of that it's fantastic the more we make our local communities resilient and uh, and able to support themselves that's great in the long run but at the same time we do you know we know we need systemic change as well as we need local change okay so in that i'd encourage us all the economy is something we're all part of so if we want to change the world we need to know how it works now okay I hope tonight's contributed to that a bit. Keep promoting change, support the Green New Deal, support any candidates that out themselves about MMT, okay? A politician that stood up and said, honestly, the deficit doesn't matter, two years ago would have got slaughtered and laughed out of town. A year ago, certainly eyebrows would be raised. If you did it now, there's a chance someone might back them up, okay? So do that, be that person. The other thing, hopefully now given a bit more flesh around the Green New Deal, is to be aware of greenwashing posters, okay? The Green New Deal is three very simple words. And there are lots of other people talking about things. One I've heard is the Green, the New Deal for Nature, which seems to be something entirely different and is about banking finance and ways of incentivizing banks to profit from how we might change, change all of these things. At its heart, the Green New Deal is really quite a simple idea. We need jobs, we need these tasks doing, we create them. And one thing I'd stress on that again is the fact it takes people from all walks of life, the high tech end, the low tech end. If you see people just talking about high tech solutions for everything, I don't think they're talking about a Green New Deal. If you see them talking about finance, they're probably not talking about a Green New Deal. Final things, avoid promoting ideas that tax pays for things. It's all really easy for us to do, okay? But all that promotes, this gets us back into the idea of money grows on rich people and leaves us hostage for big business again. So a couple of quick examples of this. I understand why a local council would do this because they're not getting the funds from government. But actually, these narratives, I think, make things worse, not better. OK, so when we start talking about having to tax rise for a climate change fund. So taxes directly funding climate change that just puts us back in that household budget analogy where we end up having no choice provide services that we need. We end up chasing our own tails. Even worse, try and avoid the idea of levies as funding things, okay? This ends up, you know, intuitively this seems popular. I put a levy on air travel and I can pay for planting trees. Well, actually, if I've got people that can plant trees, I've got land that can take trees, then I should get on and plant trees. I shouldn't make my ability to do that dependent on being able to take some levy of something that ultimately I want to get rid of. Okay, if we want to stop air travel, or at least limit it heavily, stop air travel. At which point you wouldn't get the green levy, so you couldn't fund, you couldn't fund your tree building in this case, but that doesn't matter to us because the government can just directly fund things. Okay, so avoid, avoid those arguments. Finally, don't ever, 
ever ask, how are we going to finance it? 